Support for Lab Out Loud is provided by NSTA, the National Science Teaching Association. Find out more about what NSTA has to offer at nsta.org. You're listening to Lab Out Loud, science for the classroom and beyond. And our guest today is here to talk about the intersection of art and science and its importance for student learning. Writing it down, sketching it out makes them actually think and do the observations. Taking a picture is not an observation. Any lab where they're looking at microscope slides, it's it's a little bothersome to me because they immediately get their cell phone out and they can take this picture. And I'm like, you haven't studied it. You just took a picture of it. I forced them to do what I had to do, draw two cells, showing me the difference between a prokaryotic and a eukaryotic cell. That's up next on Lab Out Loud, but first, I'm your co-host, Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell. And our guest today is Christine Perdan Curran. She is a professor of biological sciences at Northern Kentucky University and director of the NKU Neuroscience Program. Christine also represents the Society for Birth Defect Research and Prevention for the FACIB Board and serves as a judge for the FACIB Bio Art Competition. For over a decade, the BioArt Scientific Image and Video Competition has provided an artistic vehicle for biological sciences to share their research beyond the confines of their lab and professional circles. Professor Curran is here today to help us navigate the intersection of art and science and show us how teachers might use stunning visuals to inspire students and advance science literacy. One of our first questions for Chris is, how do we know art when we see it? I guess that's the question I have. How do you know it's going to be... Um... How do you know it's art? Yeah, so could... Okay, could you... What if we need to inspire the next generation of scientists, but um, we don't have beautiful things in a certain area that needs to be studied? Know what I mean? Well, uh, number one, and you know, I don't want to get into the gory, but anything that is novel or engaging, and, and certainly if you just think about how many people are fascinated by horror movies, <laughs> this is sort of the, the dark side of the science, but there were museums that attracted a lot of attention from the general public, if you think about what the circuses did. So there's obviously some ethical issues involved here sure. um, as well, but it doesn't necessarily have to fit someone's definition of beauty to engage them and, and interest them. So if you want to put a, a positive spin on it, you know, one of the things we want to do is um, promote a healthier and, and safer world. So that's mm-hmm. when you're moving from problem to solution, um, from sickness to health. Um, so we all do have different stimuli that that we respond to so in general novelty is is going to attract so and that's where i think the colorization the 3d imaging that's possible now um has has quite a bit of value um but you always need more than one way to engage so i i think when um we were learning to be teachers and that was some of the training i had was in the university of cincinnati college of education we did tend to think audio and visual, but uh-huh. now, you know, we, we have a much greater understanding that what they call manipulatives in the kindergarten classroom, we need the hands-on experience. So we tend to think of it as skills, but there's kinesthetic learning, there's, you know, the tactile. So approaching all of the senses is clearly the intersection of of art and science because it teaches us how to learn, not just to engage the learner, but actually to, by stimulating multiple senses, give them a better understanding of, of what it is they're, they're studying. And I've become more sensitive to this um, thanks to things like the American with Disabilities Act and having uh-huh. to come up with appropriate accommodations for people that may have impairments in, in one sense or another. Hmm. I have a suggestion for you. I think this, I, I'm thinking about this and thinking about my wife, who's a kindergarten teacher. And for a while, she would use National Geographic's image of the day. And it's it's a geography, but it, it has intersections with nature and science, obviously. And she would pull that up on 
to the screen in front of the class. And then back then, you know, you had to have the, all the lights down. You, our technology has gotten better. We don't have to do that <laughs> quite as much. But without telling students where it was or what something was, it would elicit conversation from students. Um, any any chance you have enough images to make like something something similar? Uh, I know you mentioned the article, you know, that a lot of elementary teachers spend under four hours a week on science. And that's uh, we we see that around us. And it's it's unfortunate. But I, I could see something like this. What I want to be able to do is I want I want something to infect literacy <laughs> instead of the other way around, <laughs> you know, because we, we hear a lot about how science. Um, oh, you can read about science, but I want science to infect literacy. <laughs> I, I guess that's what I'm getting at. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, the first um, funded project that I was on was uh, the National Science Foundation. And this was uh, in the late 90s, gave us money to develop multimedia modules, which this was, again, a collaboration. So we worked with the graphic designers and the people that were just beginning to figure out how to do video games. Um, and these were just fabulous students. And that was the whole idea. And now we call it game gamification but you know yeah. we just said multimedia back then and so we developed some modules and you know the whole idea was to use them in non-science majors courses um and then um later on i was very fortunate to get um a fellowship to the national human genome research institute where i worked with both graduate college um and undergraduate educators to develop modules to try and explain um, next generation uh, DNA sequencing and the new technologies that were coming online. And we focused on direct-to-consumer genetic testing, which was just at the time sort of coming. And, you know, right now between Ancestry23 and me, mm -hmm. um, this involves the, the general public. They're buying these things and not necessarily understanding it. But if you look at the illustrations that are part of those reports, you know, it's all about visualizing the data um, to help make sense of it. Now, whether it's interpreted correctly, I think, uh, does require a little bit more scientific literacy and understanding. It's amazing how fast that has happened. Just, just the on <laughs> having having all these tools online has happened literally. You know, within the, the last couple of decades. Absolutely, and you know, it also. Um, I taught a course in the, the spring uh, last year where I just – we'd spend time in genetics classes just teaching them techniques and teaching them data, and we never really talk about the implications. So we just did a, a seminar journal-style course um, where we thought about – it wasn't all about reading the latest literature, although we did want to give them a sense of what techniques were out there, but – I brought in a family member who had used the Ancestry site, and we just talked about her experience. What did you understand? What don't you understand? What what did you not want to know? Because you can, mm -hmm. you know, further probe your your health risks and things. Um, and it was a great conversation. So um, having someone who was a non scientist talk about. Um, and I, I'm really grateful that that she took the time to do that. And then we brought in a genetic counselor, and then you know, and continued the conversation. Um, and then we talked about genetics and race and, you know, is race a cultural mm. concept? What is the genetic basis of it? Um, but again, without the visualization um, of the phylogenies of the, you know, the chromosomes, I, I don't think we could have covered as much territory as we did. No, I, I, I and this was for non-science majors, you said? That one was for for science majors. Oh, okay. um, it was it was an elective, but the the NSF funded was to develop a, an entire um, year long series of um, biology courses to improve biologic literacy. And so there, you know, we, you had business majors, pre law. Um, and talking about the ethical, legal, and social implications was, was great fun, as well as the economics, because the business majors, when you talked about the patent battles that were erupting at the time um, okay. and continue to this day, yeah. <laughs> um, 
So it, it does get them interested. You have to open a different door to engage them. But dollar signs work. <laughs> sure. Um, in, in thinking about using imagery for instructional purposes, um, we've seen this change tremendously how teachers instruct, and especially in the sciences, but in almost every other um, avenue of, of school, I guess. And one thing I'm thinking of is, do we abuse images in, in too much in instruction, or um, can we? Um, are we? Do we have to be careful about using? I, I'll, let's just start with that one. Do we abuse images that in instruction? Okay. Um, so what I'd like to say is we need more tools in our toolbox. So I, I had to address that briefly, saying you know you need to hit more than than one sense. Um, but Good. we do okay. have to appreciate the value of them um, that and so when I set up my PowerPoints for the very structured individual I will have a series of steps one two three four five but mm -hmm. then I'll have an illustration it's amazing to me how many students are attracted to one or the other and they never see that they connect so if you can help me figure that out it's like I've told you it in text form now I'm showing you the illustration now maybe we'll watch a video so you can see it actually unfold in real time and so I think I'm doing the repetition I think I'm doing everything I was taught to do to help gauge understanding and then ask questions but it's still amazing how they see it only is that one slice and not the connections across. Um, but in terms of what we can do to do more than illustrations, uh, one of my favorite workshops was um, post-it notes, embroidery thread, and I think it was index cards, you know, uh, because high school teachers don't have budgets. And, you know, guess what? We don't have all the budgets either, and sometimes the computer <laughs> never fail. So right. I'll bring Play-Doh into class and we'll build models or whatever. Yeah. Um, you can use it for science outreach, but you can use it in, in the college or high school classroom as well. You can f look at circular DNA with embroidery thread and you can cut it with your restriction enzyme scissors to see how many pieces you get and how big are they. Mm -hmm. um, so interactive does not necessarily mean holding a pipette. You don't learn a whole lot by petting <laughs> 20 weeks True. in a row. Um, so having them build models, having them act things out, um, this is where you figure out if the students learned it or not. Yeah. So um, Translating yeah, can, from one to another like that. Well, I'm glad you brought that point up because, you know, I, I often see a lot of PowerPoints built with heavy, heavy text. And they may have an image and it may be the wrong image and it oftentimes is a funny image that may not even illustrate what's going on. Um, and I've tended to make more of my instructional presentations more graphic and illustrate and with illustrations or, or graphics and art versus text. But what I'm hearing you say is we probably need both and more. And again, think about what I'm teaching. I'm teaching a lot of pathways, um, but I'm also trying to address um, the person who isn't like me. So I think we all have the colleagues that if if I did have my camera on and this was video, you would see that my desk is a scattered mess. And there's other people <laughs> that can't. I did see that. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I did see some, uh, you know, like some some disinfecting wipes too. I mean, you're you're taking your health seriously. We saw a picture of your chromosomes too. I was happy to see that. Nice nice little uh, selfie there. Maybe we'll call them chromies or something. I don't know. Chrom <laughs> chromosome selfies. I just call it my self-portrait. I like it. I like it. Because it, it existed before selfies did. <laughs> Mine was actually printed on, as probably yours was, printed on actual film. Of course. And developed in a dark room. And it was, you know, just that process of going through that. It was just fascinating to me, too. I think yeah. these are neat. These will need to be in the show notes, Brian. Ah yes, we can we can do that. Um, we should we can get we can actually get we'll get a picture of you, Chris, like a screenshot of you holding up your chromosomes. We'll use that as your your photo if that if that works. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I, I loved seeing this. I think we are at a, an intersection of instruction where students have devices, teachers have by and large ways to project images 
on screens in front of students. And again, they don't necessarily have to always turn the lights down. I know I know we're still transitioning some technology in a lot of classrooms, don't get me wrong, but um, we're we're at a point where students can consume a lot of things like this. And I think it's powerful to find images that they don't know. They can't Google necessarily, what am I looking at? And that really has, I think, the power for students to, to, to dive in, to get you know, see something like a phenomenon on the screen and try to figure out what's going on or why is this happening? No, that's true with microscopes as well, um, because any lab where they're looking at microscope slides, it's it's a little bothersome to me <laughs> because they immediately get their cell phone out and they can take this picture. And I'm like, you haven't studied it. You just took a picture of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the techniques and they don't like it, okay, <laughs> is I force them to do what I had to do. Didn't draw, it? draw it out. <laughs> draw it out, you know, like, and on exams, you know, draw two cells showing me the difference between a prokaryotic and a eukaryotic cell. A, it's really fast to grade it, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but B, you know what they know and what they don't know, what they understand, and you can make them do it at the board. The uh, The beauty of that... Um, they they have the paint now that makes your walls into whiteboards. Sure. Students love this. We have a student lounge and most of our classrooms, and we have these little study rooms, and the markers go dry and disappear quickly. You know, sure. so whether it's trying to tackle organic chemistry or um, a biological pathway. They understand, even though they, they may not appreciate it, um, that writing it down, sketching it out makes them actually think and do the observations. Taking a picture is not an observation, but sketching no, the yeah. two most important differences between species A and species B or flower A and flower B or bird A and bird B, they have to recognize similarities and differences and boy, doesn't that get us into evolution, which just needs to be injected everywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, just the time it takes to make those drawings is helping them process and actually learn that material. I was reading an article recently about to-do lists and all the different pieces of software out there. Like, if you want to make a presentation, there's PowerPoint, and there's Google Slides, and maybe Keynote. If you if you want to do word processing, you got your Word and Google Docs or something like that, but there are dozens and dozens of to-do lists because the process of doing a to-do list is actually, it needs to be done between you and your brain and you need to like go through that, that motion. And so part of the discussion concluded with, you know, paper's not so bad <laughs> because <laughs> it, uh, it allows you to like, uh, physically write down those lists and, um, kind of pr process that information and when what they found is like apps that were helping too much um all the tasks became meaningless and they just had this big you know huge list that never got done and i think that would be similar to you know if you just snapped a picture of of um of the cell for example you talked about you'd be like okay <laughs> learned <laughs> like no <laughs> it's it you're not you're not appreciating the amount of time that goes by um for you to kind of really digest that in your mind. I'm fascinated by some of the apps that are out there that I think have learned from this. And like you can draw on the whiteboard and then they, they take an image of the entire whiteboard and, and help you manipulate that. But the, the initial process of writing it down, you still have to do, or like there's even a post-it one where you can uh, have everyone put information on a post-it, put it on a board and then take a picture and then it converts it to digital things that you can maneuver. So those mm -hmm. things, you still keep that initial learning, that physical writing it down, sketching it out, learning, and then you translate it into the digital world. Sure. Chris, who's the contest for the bioimaging open to? Is this coming from industry? Is it coming from universities? Uh, do we see students participate in the, in the contest? So, and again, FASEB is the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology. So there's 30 scientific societies that um, formed the federation. Um, so it's 
a nonprofit organization um, that supports biological and biomedical research. So it's it's open and and free for anyone. So it's an annual contest that they started uh, several years ago to help promote um, science and science literacy, but obviously with a biological bent. Hmm. What are some um, what are some submissions that you were surprised at? Like, wow, I never thought this was something we'd ever see. That that's a tough one. Um, I, you know, my initial, of course, reaction is always, I I, I wish I had got that one. <laughs> I, wish I was better at preparing slides, you know, for confocal imagery where you can get those beautiful three dimensional fluorescent dyes. Um, so I, I think I told you I, I can't, you know draw that straight line and I just, you know, I don't have those fine motor skills. <laughs> um, so I, they all overwhelm me. There's not one in particular. Um, of course I'm, you know, always a little bit biased, you know, there's, um, if it involves embryonic development. So, um, that was, that was one of the previous year's winners. Um, because that that really helps us understand things that are invisible. You know, you're, hey, I was pregnant three times, right? But did you have to wait for that end result? I only had an ultrasound with my um, third child. So I didn't even get that sneak peek peek that we're all used to, and the technology was so poor back then. It was like, are you sure that's human? Yeah, (laughs) now they have those 3D ones. Those are crazy. I know. Um so just are you talking about the chicken embryo or it's like yes it almost looks like da vinci's chicken <laughs> touching uh, the, it you does. Know, the <laughs> <laughs> or not da vinci is that what chicken. it is the 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 uh, are you where, thinking uh, of michelangelo yes thank you my name Mich- uh, uh, the, the ceiling the ceiling yes yeah sistine yeah. chapel isn't that what it is yes yeah <laughs> yeah it looks like the the sistine chapel but with chicken embryos <laughs> I was looking at it and I was like, wait a minute. All of a sudden it just dawned on me. Something's not right about that other chicken because it's mutated. (laughs) Chris, are are there like white whales out there? Like, oh, you're just waiting. (laughs) Like you haven't seen this yet. And and you know someone's going to just one day they're going to get an image that you're like, we've all been waiting for this. Well, there are white whales. We know that, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And one of my there you go. English faculty is a is a Melville scholar, so he teaches a course <laughs> on the art. So I've I've had some of my students actually do um, sketches for the the art project associated with his um, his Melville class on on Moby Dick. Um, we digress again, but you know this, these are the fun collaborations um yeah and i'm working right now with uh the head of our dance program um and a an adjunct faculty member who teaches um african communal dances so i have a neuroscience student who's trying to understand um the the benefits of of learning these dances which are so non-western in terms of uh building community and breaking down um racial barrier so that you can value the culture and, and value the individuals. So the the intersections of arts and, and sciences go so deep and there's so much opportunity when we talk to each other um, to, to improve not only the understanding of the science students, but more importantly, the, the 90 or more percent that, that aren't science majors. Mm-hmm. Do you find that there's crossovers that uh, they came in as like an art major, but they they were pulled into the sciences or vice versa? You know, a science major that uh, has taken a more uh, art approach uh, to be the artist for a a scientific endeavor or something like that. So I know of an English major who ended up being a microbiology professor and a microbiologist who's now the director of our writing program so well there you go <laughs> uh how much more data do you need <laughs> <laughs> so it happens though it's uh it definitely i think we see people get interests intertwined and then they they find a pathway that that appe- appeals to them more or where their their talents might lie more even though their interest may have may have initially told them a, a different path in, initially 
Absolutely. The National Association of Science Writers, roughly half their members started as bench scientists who realized that they ha- they needed the creative outlet. Um, so they ended up, you know, doing photography, videography, and, you know, obviously the the writing to explain science to the general public requires a tremendous amount of collaboration and, and creativity. Um, you mentioned National Geographic as an excellent example. Mm-hmm. Um, their photographers came here for um, a, a special series looking at conservation biology, and the images were just so provocative and, and got multiple disciplines and departments and colleges and involved in thinking about the issue as, as more than um, what species, you know, where does it live, um, but just wanting to, to protect and, and conserve not only the animal but the environment that uh, they need to thrive. Hmm. Before we let you go, Chris, um, we you teased a little bit talking about K-12 science education and um, if we have a, a science educator out there or, or a primary teacher out there who is thinking, you know, I'd really like to get some imagery, science imagery into my instruction, um, how do they go about that? What, Where, where should they start looking? Um, well, definitely, FASEB has just updated its website, so I can't give you a specific link, but FASEB BioArt is a great way to, to get access um, to all of the images from the, the different years of the contest. Um, and the, the word of warning, though, because I, I have to teach our students, it's too easy to find stuff on the Internet. <laughs> and yeah. so when they find interesting images, I always tell them, you know, you have to take the next step and figure out where it came from. And oftentimes you discover um, that you can't find the source, so you can't trust it. So there are a number of excellent sites um, that um, – are set up by scientific societies and by universities. So um, look for the .edu, look for the .gov. Um, when I teach environmental toxicology, um, the NOAA websites um, have excellent images um, so that you can show what's happening in the coral reefs. You can see you know, where the oceans are warming. You can um, actually do sort of a time course. What did it look like 10 years ago? What does it look like now? Um, so the government, your tax dollars are at work. Yeah, creating. yeah for USGS sure. USGS has some excellent maps and images um, that can tell you, you know, where are the pollutants? So, you know, you can zoom in on your home state. Um, and most of these are copyright. Uh, they, they don't have copyright because they come from government entities and now they may have hired a photographer and that may get muddied in there but uh when you go to a government website the the data and the documents there are 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 for you to use exactly and you know you got google maps right um so mountaintop um mining in you know in our area in the state of kentucky and west virginia is a huge issue and again you can find those before and after images so depending on what your local um, issue is um, if you're interested in the birds you got the Audubon Society obviously um, birds and art have gone well together there um, you've got Ansel Adams artwork if you're interested in, in looking at um, what's happened out west and think you can talk about the wildfires that are there now um, they're in extreme drought again these depending on what topic there there are many ways to look at the data literally through a map mm-hmm. or a satellite image that will bring home um, the points that that they want to make but the other thing is don't be afraid to reach out to your, your local university because we want to connect. We are committed um, to do outreach at our university. We have a Center for Integrative Natural Sciences and Mathematics that has a website for K-12 educators. So things that we produce, um, resources we have, um, they're available. We want to share. We want to hear from you what your needs are um, because without you, we're not going to get the students that that we need at the university um, studying for the next generation of science. Is it just because I'm a science guy that like graphs and charts also really are visually appealing to me too. 
Um, maybe that's just, maybe it's just me. <laughs> um, like, like Sankey diagrams. I love those. Like there's, I just go to Google images or an image search and, you know, type in Sankey diagram and look at all these different diagrams of, you know, it's usually energy flow. So I'm a physics teacher. So I love all of those. We, at some point, teaching science, learning science, or being a citizen who has to, um, you know, understand science, encounter graphs, charts, those kinds of things. Is there room for um, do's and don'ts, I guess, or things that will make them more visually illuminating? Because, because sometimes, you know, a graph gets a bad a bad rap. One of the interesting things, you know, again, it goes back to collaborating with with graphic designers and illustrators and um, my own daughter, who's finishing her fine arts degree, um, Carolina, does a guest lecture for me um, Mm -hmm. in our neuroscience 101 class, which is non-majors. And this is where understanding the artist's perspective of the color or the line or the shape uh, and her, she really dug into the neuroscience of color, um, hmm. for example, and how each color has both a positive and a negative connotation. So we, blue skies are good, but if you have the blues, it's bad. You know, those are mm-hmm. examples. Oh, sure. Um, so and that varies it, from culture to culture, too. Exactly. So when you say a graph, it's not that simple. You, you really have yeah. to think about infographics. Um, which um, a colleague of mine at the University of Washington did uh, a wonderful presentation talking about how in risk communication and, you know, with COVID, it's all about risk communication. But instead of showing a chart or a number, if you see sort of um, the graphic of little people cutouts, so you know, just yeah. think about and the the number of them affected um, or the the relative risk. You can illustrate that so much more clearly when you're collaborating with someone that has the artistic knowledge on, you know, what shape, what color is going to pop out versus just the graph. But then we also have to remember that black on white is still pretty good contrast. So, you know, I'll sure. mention Ansel Adams again is, you know, <laughs> choose wisely. Um, yeah. Not everything has to be in motion. Special effects, we talked about PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, if it's a special effect, it should not it should, be used You shouldn't notice slide. it. It should just be used. <laughs> it shouldn't have to. I always had, uh, I remember a college professor telling me, the first time you use the crawl animation, you've just wasted it for when you need something to actually crawl on the screen. You know, things like that. You got to use it very judiciously. Um, yeah. The 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 thing I would have my students do is give them a chart or a diagram or something like that that was summarizing some information that we're trying to learn, and then have them create a new visual. You know, maybe they translate it to. I, I loved it because I didn't know what I was going to get from them. Mm-hmm. And so they'd work in groups and all of a sudden I'd get different pie graphs or like little, you know, little people stacked up or things like that of um, trying to represent for, I think one of the lessons I did is like world energy use. And it was, it was a really kind of um, fun, rewarding way for me as a teacher too, because you could, you could see them, you know, kind of, kind of stretch their I don't know, art muscles, which they, you know, by the time they're juniors and seniors in high school, maybe weren't expecting to use in a science class. So this is another example of kind of getting them to keep that, you know, uh, stimulation going. Anything we can do to convince them the answer is not on page 23. Um, <laughs> we've done a good job. And this Wait, 23? I'm going to write that down right now. Programmed. They are programmed to find an answer, and that's not science. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, please, yeah. please. Uh, yeah, it's not uh, like a science. Whoever you are that are educating the next generation, yeah. um, because that's going to help. I mean, let's face it. Um, those who are demonizing poor Tony Fauci right now, mm-hmm. um, who's honestly trying to give you the latest, which includes uncertainty. And change. <laughs> but part of it is j- just being programmed to want the answer in black and white on page 23. Correct. It's not there. It never was there. 
<laughs> yeah, right. that's something that, um, we've been talking about in a couple episodes now is that um, that idea that science is not, I think what you're saying, it's not on a page, you can't look it up, that science involves a lot of talking, discussion. Um, discourse. Discourse, working it out. And and through that process, it's going to change. And that's that's why, you know, you know, you have people like, well, now now it says this, you know, now butter's bad for you, you know, and things like that. And it's like, well, you know, with new information comes new, new, new information, I guess. But, <laughs> you know, new, new pathways for that. But that's hard, I think, sometimes. People want it to be, I suppose things would be so much easier if you could just walk through a forest, pick up a bar, turn it over, and it just says, you know, aluminum, 27. Oh, look, I discovered it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But, you know, absolutely. Um, but speaking of fun things you can do to teach concepts, because I, I like your idea. Um, gummy worms and gummy bears are also in my arsenal. Um, ah. And you can use construction paper. Again, very low cost things. And you set up different ecosystems with different colors of gummy worms and gummy bears and, um, you know, predator and prey relationships. Um, what's going to happen? You know, who's who can hide? Um, who's got the advantage. So, um, but here's the fun thing, right? Because you do this, you know, when kids are hungry, um, and then you let them, after they work through their different little habitats, um, you let them have at it, you know, take as many Mm -hmm. as you want. And then you can say, and do humans have impacts on any of these habitats? It's like, oh yeah, they're all gone. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Their mouths are full. It's coming out of there. (laughs) Well, thank you so much, Chris, for um, all your insights and introducing us to uh, some of these ideas. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Um, Love to talk science and definitely love to promote the idea of the, the value of science and why we need artists. Um, we, we gotta work together. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Lab Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about some of the things discussed in this episode or previous episodes, you can find show notes at our website, laboutloud.com. If you have a guest idea or a future topic that you'd like to see on Lab Out Loud, go to our contact page and send us a message. Also, you can subscribe to Lab Out Loud on your favorite podcasting app, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to find podcasts. While you're there, leave us a review and rating. Your input helps others find our show. Thanks again for listening.